Hi everyone, I'm Alexander Holinsky and I'll be presenting our paper, Reducing Drift and Structure from Motion Using Extended Features. This is joint work with David Garrity, Jan-Michael Fromm, Chris Sweeney, and Rick Saliski from Facebook and Facebook Reality Labs. So as a bit of motivation, recently it's gotten pretty easy for us to capture 3D models of everyday scenes, right? It's just a matter of pulling out our smartphone and capturing a short video clip. Once you have a video scanning the object, we can throw it into our favorite reconstruction algorithm and it usually gives us something pretty reasonable. This is all thanks to Structure for Motion and SLAM, which are the underlying methods that track the camera position in 3D. These methods take as input a collection of images or a video sequence and produce as output the 3D position and orientation of the camera at each frame, as well as a sparse point cloud of the scene structure. And over recent years, these methods have gotten to be way more accurate and robust. But there are still some failure cases, and one of them is drift. So what is drift? Well, to explain this, I'll need to give a bit of background on how most of these structure for motion systems work. So structure for motion is trying to capture information about how the camera is moving around a scene in 3D. And so to extract this information, these systems usually rely on some form of feature tracking. So if we have a bunch of images, we'll usually start by detecting and matching some features. Most commonly, these will be points like SIFT, FAST, or ORB features. And you can detect these points in each frame individually, and then for images which observe the same part of the scene, you can try to find matches for each of the key points. And these matches give us some useful information. Based on how the points have moved from one frame to the other, we can infer how the camera has moved between taking these two pictures. Also, certain key points will have moved more than others, and this gives us cues on their relative distance or depth from the camera. So this pairwise estimation process extracts information from these feature point matches and gives us a pairwise pose, which consists of rotation and translation, as well as a 3D point cloud of the matched and triangulated features. And we can do this for all pairs of frames that we're trying to reconstruct, giving us a bunch of disjoint two-frame reconstructions of the scene. But what we want is a consistent reconstruction of the whole scene using all of the frames. So in order to get that, we still need to integrate all of these pairwise poses into a single consistent reconstruction. And there are different ways of doing this, either globally or incrementally, but all of these will take the already estimated pairwise poses and find a global reconstruction which agrees with all of them. So at a high level, this is the process through which we're creating a reconstruction. To to recap, we start by detecting features in each frame, then we try to match features across frames which observe the same parts of the scene. We then use those matches to estimate pairwise reconstructions, and finally, we integrate those pairwise reconstructions to create the global reconstruction. And so, now that I've given the whole background, let's get back to the main question, which is, what is drift and where does it come into this whole process? Well, each of these stages that I've just described has multiple sources of error. So just as an example, Let's say we were a bit shaky when we captured our video, and some of our images have a bit of motion blur. Well, this might result in some of our feature points being displaced by some amount. And this error could propagate through subsequent steps of the pipeline, resulting in a slightly incorrect pairwise estimate. And ultimately, when we integrate, if we don't have enough information to contradict this erroneous estimate, that estimate will ultimately affect the pose of a whole bunch of later frames. And motion blur isn't even the only possible error. There are quite a few other sources of error in the whole pipeline. Like for example, the camera sensor noise may affect the feature point locations, or your camera may be a rolling shutter camera, or there may be some estimation errors in your pairwise reconstruction. And these are just to name a few. But the effects of drift are frequently seen in real life captures. For example, if you wanted to use your smartphone camera to capture a whole building facade, in many cases, you'll see a very skewed reconstruction, like this one, which we're showing from above, that obviously doesn't match the real building structure, which you can see when we compare it to a satellite image of the same building. In fact, for some scenes like this, and for some camera setups, no matter how hard you try, it's nearly impossible to get a good, drift-free reconstruction without changing your camera setup. And the reason for this is that some of these sequences have fewer connections or fewer pairwise estimates for each frame. So to illustrate why this matters, let me show you what happens when we only have two pairwise estimates per frame. In other words, when we only have pairwise estimates between neighboring frames. In this case, a single wrong pairwise estimate can mess up our whole sequence, right? Because it's our only connection between two different parts of the reconstruction. So we actually want more redundant pairwise connections so that even if one of them is wrong, we'll still have enough information to identify it as an outlier. But the number of redundant pairwise connections that we can have depends on the overlap of our sequence. Effectively, for each frame, how many other frames observe the same part of the scene. The more of these, the better, obviously. But certain cameras and configurations result in limited overlap. For instance, if your camera is too close to the subject, or if your field of view is too small, you're seeing less of the scene in each frame, making it less likely that other frames will see the same part of the scene. 
And this is why you typically see a lot of capture rigs using wide field of view or fisheye cameras, because it allows them to have a high chance of overlap with other frames. But in most cases, we don't have a choice. We're stuck with our smartphones, which have low fields of view, and we want to capture something like a building in a city center. Sometimes we have no choice but to capture the building from the adjacent sidewalk. Well, what happens then? Is there any way to avoid drift? Well, this is the main problem that we're solving in our paper. Our method makes it possible to get accurate structure in a lot of these scenarios that would be nearly impossible to capture without visible drift. So how does it work? Well, as we said, normally, structure for motion establishes constraints between pairs of frames which mutually observe the same part of the scene by finding and matching feature points from each frame. Our method addresses drift through what we call extended features, which can be matched across frames that see totally different parts of the scene, allowing us to enforce pose constraints on pairs of frames that are arbitrarily distant. We demonstrate two examples of extended features, one for addressing rotational drift and one for addressing translational drift. For our first extended feature, which addresses rotational drift, we use vanishing points. So if you have a bunch of parallel lines in a scene, like in this image, you can find groups of parallel lines and trace them to the point of intersection. And that gives you a 3D point called a vanishing point. And three of these orthogonal vanishing point directions, the three vectors from the camera to the vanishing point, can also be thought of as a coordinate frame, which remains constant for a Manhattan scene. So as we move around a building like this one, wherever we find Manhattan structure, we can estimate the vanishing point directions relative to the camera viewing direction. And this gives us another signal on the orientation of the camera. And unlike feature points, we can compare these vanishing point directions between any two frames. They don't need to be seeing the same parts of the scene. So this provides us with drift-free global constraints on specifically the rotations of our reconstructed cameras. And we see that when we apply these constraints, it removes a lot of the bending in our reconstructions. But still, it doesn't solve the problem entirely, and we can see that our reconstructed structure still doesn't match the satellite image. And this is because we've only removed the drift from the rotational component, but there's still drift in the translational and scale components. So for that, we have a second extended feature, which are global planes. For each frame in the video, we can identify points which belong to global planes in the scene and use these to constrain the position of the reconstructed camera, resulting in a significantly more accurate reconstruction. So let me show an illustrated example. If this is our first frame and we start walking around the building, very soon our frames won't be observing the same part of the scene, so there won't be any shared feature tracks, and thus no direct constraints applied between this pair of frames, because we can't have a pairwise reconstruction. However, if we're able to figure out that the feature tracks in these two frames belong to the same global plane, that gives us a very strong constraint on the relative position of these two frames, because we know how far away the points are from each of the cameras, and we know that the points should be coplanar. And it's actually pretty easy for us to find these types of local planar sections. Looking at our two frame pairwise reconstructions, we already see a lot of point clouds that have obvious planar structure. And we now also have vanishing point information for each frame. So we know the major orthogonal axes for each of these frames. And as a result, we know some likely directions along which we're bound to find strong planes. So we can perform plane sweeps along each of these three orthogonal vanishing point directions, which will give us a bunch of local planes in each of the pairwise reconstructions. And then, when we want to find out which of these local planes correspond to each other across pairwise reconstructions, that's pretty easy too. Our local plane sweeps were searching the point clouds in our pairwise reconstructions for clusters of points which are coplanar. But these points are actually feature tracks which have already been matched to other frames. So the same points already exist in other pairwise reconstructions. And we can use the membership of these feature points in local planes to figure out which local planes correspond to the same global planes. And finally, we can take this information in our integration step and enforce these linked local planes to be coplanar in the final reconstruction by optimizing the camera translations. And it's important to note that the planes that we're discovering don't actually need to be real visible planes. Our plane sweeps can discover things like a slicing plane of the building, like a row of windows, which allows us to impose scale and height constraints between frames on totally opposite sides of the building. So to wrap up, these techniques allow us to get really high quality reconstructions of scenes like this, which would otherwise be nearly impossible to capture without drift, by leveraging information about things like man-made structure. And so we've shown the exaggerated case where we have very low field of view cameras and the drift is very visible in the final reconstruction. But even with larger fields of view, although drift may be not quite as visible in the final reconstructions, it's usually present just to a smaller degree. So our added constraints can still be useful there.
So that's all I've got for today. But if you're interested in some more details, uh, please stop by our poster session or check out our paper. Thanks.